Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We have had many different ideas about how we're going to seat. I hope you like this final result. I think it looks brilliant. Um, this session is titled, Can Traditional Banks Compete with AI and FinTech Disruptors? And on this panel, we have Sheikha Al-Bahar, who is the Deputy Group CEO of NBK, the National Bank of Kuwait. Uh, we have T.S. Anil, CEO of Monzo the British Disruptor Bank. We have Zoe Cruz, founder and CEO of Menai Financial Group. And right at the end, we have Sim Shabalala, chief executive of the Standard Bank Group in Africa. Um, I question this title. Can traditional banks compete with AI and fintech disruptors? Or should it be the other way around? Because one of the stats in our briefing notes really caught my eye. It says that no fintech company has yet entered the ranks of the global top 250 banks by assets, and that is despite $550 billion being invested into fintech. Zoe, I'm going to start with you. Unpick this problem for me. You come from traditional finance. You're now, of course, in digital assets. Why is this the case, or is it? Well, it depends how you define the largest. But, um uh, I can give you a couple of examples. Um, fintech uh, companies like PayPal are certainly uh, larger than the top 250 banks. Uh, there is a bank that uh, prior to 2013 did not exist. Uh, it's called New Bank in Brazil, whose market cap is $75 billion. It has 100 million customers. And when you think about the traditional banks like Citigroup, uh, Citi's market cap, depending on the week, is $125 billion, and it has 200 million customers. So uh, I don't buy this premise that fintech uh, companies have not gotten there and exceeded the wildest expectations. You think they're already there. TS is very happy with what you had to say. Um, Sim, I want to go to you. You're going to tell me that Although you are a traditional bank, a legacy bank, some may even call you a dinosaur, um, you are innovating. You are interested in cloud computing, artificial intelligence. You have a digital banking service. What is it that a disruptor bank like Monzo can do that you can't? As Zoe, first of all, you made mention of dinosaurs, and I said to you, well, then I'm going to take you back to history. <laughs> 4,000 years ago in Babylon, <laughs> in the temples, people were taking deposits on a serious note and taking those deposits and advancing them to people uh, who had better use for that money. And when people who had deposited that money wanted their money back, they didn't care whether that money was financing a ship or not. They wanted that money immediately. And so maturity transformation and risk management is the heart of what we do as a bank. Um, fintechs can join us. Uh, there has been a theory that they will eat our lunch. Um, that theory, I think, has changed. They no longer want to eat our lunch. They want to buy us lunch and for us to share the lunch. Uh, because <laughs> partnership has become fundamental and important. So that's the first point I wanted to make. The second one is just think of the bank that I work for. Our name is the Standard Bank Group, the Standard Bank of South Africa. When we were formed, we were called the Standard Bank of British South Africa Limited. So, for 162 years, we've had the same name. We do the same thing. We take deposits, we advance loans, we facilitate payments, we help people manage their risk. Today, we do precisely the same thing. Uh, we're engaged uh, in fierce competition with incumbents and fierce competition with some tech companies that are trying to uh, compete with us. But our view is that uh, there is portions of the value chain that they can have because we can't do it any better than they can. But we help our people uh, with liquidity, with capital, with creating wealth, with preserving that wealth, with passing it on to future generations, and we'll be doing that for another 160 years, either in partnership with them or without them. Let me just make one last point. Uh, we're not in competition. However, uh, we have uh, an asset base of $170 billion, uh, an equity tier one capital of roughly $13 billion. We generate a return on equity of 18.5%, and when last I checked, that's all shareholders care about. Yeah. So you can take that into account as you answer this then, TS. Um, you can join the big banks. So I'm jumping in the bit to answer them? it. Uh, <laughs> but here's the way I think about it. So at, at, at the heart of it, I think is a false dichotomy. 
when we say banks versus fintechs, we're kind of implying that one camp is, is not the other. But here we are, where a tech company, a VC-funded tech company, the classic um, startup that's become a scale-up, and we're a fully regulated bank. So there's a bit of a false dichotomy in saying, is it banks versus fintechs? Because I think we, could, we can be both. I genuinely think of this as a race. I think in the future, just like every other sector of the economy has been transformed by technology, financial services will be as well. And the reason it hasn't happened as yet at the, at the scale, uh, given the size of the opportunity, is because you have these two different camps. You have the incumbent banks and you have the challengers. The bet is whether the incumbent banks will get tech faster than whether the challengers will get banking. And most incumbent banks, and I say this with a lot of respect for Sim and other, you know, um, all of the other banks, Avia Shekhar's bank as well, most banks are saddled with legacy technology that makes it really, really hard and expensive. So are there ba incumbent banks who have the smarts to, to adapt their technology fast enough and embrace new technology? Sure. But as a sector, as a category, for the existing banks to catch up on the technology race is a much harder best to place. But, in, but challengers like us, that's the, that, the question for us is, will we get, as Sim was pointing out, will we understand treasury and balance sheet and underwriting and credit risk and every version of what running a bank means? And my bet is, every day of the week, that we will. Right, the best among us, the best among any of these two categories would be people that can do both of those things at scale. And in doing so, transform people's relationship with money. Because that's the size of the prize. The oldest industry in the world, core to everybody's lives, is still languishing in terms of the tech journey. And the size of the prize is to transform that for customers. And you have to get great at tech and great at banking. Challenger banks and incumbent banks, Sheikh al -Dahar. How do we like these terminologies, <laughs> these terms? And can you compete with the challenger banks? Well, uh, let me just start with when we talk about FinTech, we have to, you know, agree on the difference between different segments, different uh, sectors. Then we say, what's the future? For retail, I fully agree there should not be a commercial bank. It has to be a digital bank, be mainly with the youth, the future clients of any bank. So in Kuwait and MBK, basically, uh, we, based on research, we've noticed that the youth, they are not interested to deal with commercial banks. They consider us as the bank of the father, the grandfather, and so on. So we decided to go into digital. Then we succeeded to launch the digital bank, WEI, in December 2022. And it was a great, you know, uh, uh, launch. You don't believe it. We achieved four times the target clients. Most of the youth, 17 years and above, they locked in, you know, remotely. And this, of course, helped with... Uh, the EKYC and so on. It's in agreement, of course, with the regulator. But FinTech puts kind of a pressure on commercial banks to be more efficient, to be focusing on customer-centric and customer satisfaction. So we worked on the back office, the operation. So now we have RPA. Robotic are handling most, I, I can say 90% of our processes. So this is the change. This is the, uh, let's say, I don't want to say that FinTech will substitute banks. No way, no way. If we talk about, you know, uh, uh, wholesale banking, no way that you can talk to a robot or you can finalize a deal, a, fint a large deal or giga deal or mega deal huh, through the digital bank. You need someone to sit and discuss with them terms and conditions and so on. But yes, we have to focus on future clients, retail. It has to be 100% digitized rather than they go to the you know, uh, branch and sign uh, papers and so on. And we succeeded to play on both uh, sides. And now we can replicate the success in another market, which, which is in Egypt. So basically, fintech companies are there to be acquired by banks. And this is what we've done. 
Ooh, that's a great place to end that on. That was fantastic. I'm sorry to say that for any if, if it's I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go back to TS. <laughs> yeah, fintech firms are there to be acquired. Exactly. And this is what we've done. I mean, through the wealth management, we acquired, you know, end-to-end -end, uh, digital small company. And now we are adding it to like our to platform. Here. I'm so sorry. We have an interruption. Or do we? Hmm. I need to add something here. As has been mentioned by some of you, the real disruption isn't fintech versus banks. It's the $23 trillion shadow banking sector. It's unregulated, AI-driven, and full of alternative lenders. Are we about to be blindsided? Well, that's taken our conversation in... in can I, can I take right. the first one? Yes, please. Yes, I think this gets to the heart of my point earlier, which is that to succeed at scale, you've got to be good at all things tech and all things banking. So <laughs> to my AI friend's question, <laughs> right? <Friend or> foe. <laughs> shadow banking, unregulated, the world of, world of that murky finance, right? right? The reason it, it's, it's, it's going to be a challenge is because it doesn't know how to operate in a regulated environment. So from a Monzo perspective, right? Monzo is a bank built around the customer. We have the best tech, and we know how to operate in a regulated context and scale in a regulated context. So bringing the murkiness, uh, people that play outside of the regulatory perimeter into this, I think is, is the way the, the direction of travel will be in the industry. Zoe. So it's so hard to put into sound bites in 25 minutes such a vast topic. <laughs> uh, when you got 11 left, by the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, it, for me, it, the successful banks, finan not banks, financial institutions, because even the moniker has to change. It's not fintech and traditional banks. The, the financial institutions, they will be uh, the ones that actually understand what is their core competency by region or what client segment they're serving, and they're going to use technology faster than anybody else. So I'll give you just even within this conversation where we got binary by virtue of the sound bites we're supposed to be talking about, JP Morgan is one of the most successful banks in the world, I would say. They have zero interest to bank the un underbanked. They're spending billions of dollars, billions in cybersecurity, because the core competency is if you actually want to have zero concern about where your money is, I mean, my small company's account is with JP Morgan. <laughs> you know, I love the fintech world, I love revolution. But. <laughs> but, so billions of dollars with an S on cybersecurity. Uh, Jamie Dimon, who used to be my business school classmate, by the way, and even back then he seemed to be brilliant, uh, he already has created a stable coin called Onyx, he spent billions on digital assets, billions with an S. This is a traditional bank. Uh, and so for me, we, you look at statistics, Tether, which is a stable coin, is one of the largest treasury, US treasury buyers in the world at the moment, out of nowhere. That's why all of a sudden the US government with all its mountain of debt is very pro stable coin. Um, they have $125 billion in assets, and they're making $5.5 billion in the, first, in the last six months, they made $5.5 billion out of nowhere. Jamie Dimon is creating his own stable coin. So what I'm saying, the world is changing geometrically. The only winning strategy is who is your client? And what I talk about, because I'm in the digital asset space, I'm having a lot of fun. Um, when I think about the SWIFT uh, correspondent banking system, Nostra and Vostra accounts, it works fine if I'm at Morgan Stanley sending $100 million to JP Morgan. If you're an SME in Nigeria or Kenya, not so good. So the underbanked of the 8 billion people in the world, half of them are underbanked or unbanked. If you decide that's who you're going to go after, and you're relentless in what they need, especially the younger demographic, you're going to be very successful. So, I mean, you're pretty much saying here that neither traditional banking nor fintech are going to beat 
each other. Would you agree with that, Sim? Is, in 20 years' time, what does the future of banking look like for us all? So, you know, forgive me for repeating myself. So I'll say again, we'll be taking deposits, advancing loans, <laughs> helping people manage risk, helping them facilitate payments. We'll be doing some of it on our own and we'll be partnering with others. And in this context, frankly, if you think about us, we've spent billions of dollars in our core banking system, our system of accounts, uh, which has put us in a position to be able to accelerate the ability of us giving our clients the, the, the personalized solutions that they require from us at the moment that they are doing a transaction in a similar way to what a new entrant would do. And so what we've done as an incumbent is convert ourselves into a startup to take uh, TK's point. And so you can open an account with us within seconds, literally sitting in your home uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with our app. Uh, you can make payments almost immediately. Um, you don't need to go to a startup to do that. You can do that with an incumbent with $13 billion worth of capital in the southern tip of the African continent. And so the point is that clients, both retail and wholesale, want their intermediation services provided to them in the same way as the hyperscalers uh, would be able to provide them. Um, and so we would be arguing that, again, in 20 years' time, and, uh, the banks will be doing exactly what they're doing, except that they will be doing it with technology. And the winners are going to be those who marry the intermediation capability with a technical capability. Are you a winner? Yes, undoubtedly. <laughs> Our return on equity is 18.5%. Ask TK's uh, return on equity. <laughs> Yes. Oh, High 20s, it's getting spicy on stage. High 20s. High 20s. <laughs> yeah. But just there's one interesting thing in both what um, both Zoe and Sim said, which, mm. which I find interesting, which is denominating the investment and capability in the billions of dollars spent. Right? I have a slight disagreement with that point. And the reason I say that is we get outspent from a technology perspective by our high street competitors in the UK by probably 10 is to one, right? Orders of magnitude we probably get 20x the value for every pound that we spend though. Because when you build on a new stack, when you build on a microservices architected stack of the future, you don't need to throw armies of people at the problem and do UAT user acceptance testing for, for months and we, before you can release anything. We release into production dozens of times a day relative to the quarterly releases and so on that large mainframe banks do. So the, the the genius over here is not in the dollars spent on technology, but in how it's being spent and the clean slate version of technology. So I just wanted, so I would never pride ourselves on the amount we have spent on it, but the quality of the outcome. And the reason I think that the tech world disruption is such an interesting thing to, to observe is because how that tech money gets spent, what actually gets built, can be wildly different, wildly more resilient, well, even in the context while of While we're on that, I mean, you are building Monzo out. You're planning to offer more services and expand, obviously, in the US. That's a lot to take on. How many services do you think you are going to offer people? Are you going to be everything to everyone? Will you be doing the mortgages, the pensions, the wealth management? Do you plan to be everything? And what about this US expansion? Because I think that's going to be challenging. So absolutely, we want to be all things money to the customer segments we choose to target, which is effectively individuals and small businesses. And for them, we want to be the single place where all of their money needs get met. We expect the majority of those needs are things that we will meet ourselves. But to your example of mortgages, uh, I don't know that we need to put mortgages on our own balance sheet. Right? There's large banks with lots of balance sheets. For you, it's partnerships. Do, we, we can do that as a partnership. We will, we will originate for another balance sheet not deploy our capital against it and generate capital-free fee income on the back of that. Right? So, but the intent is absolutely all things in a single place. And your US point is an, is an interesting one. And the US actually demonstrates how when you have large monolithic banks that can't meet individual customers' needs effectively enough, a plethora of fintech companies get formed to solve narrow needs. So yeah. as an example, P2P gets met by one fintech company. Alternate lending gets met by a different fintech company, something else by a different fintech company. But that only exacerbates the anxiety that most people have with their money when you're staring at like 20 different things that you need to manage. But when you bring it in a single place with the power of technology, with the best design and the best user experience in the world, while also being a great bank that does all of the intermediation of risk in the appropriate ways, balance sheet, underwriting, all of that, 
then what you do is you create a single place where customers can actually exhale and they, they can manage their money a heck of a lot better and smarter. And that's what we're playing for. Because I do think, like in the, in the UK, there is no Venmo. People will say, Monzo me the money. Oh, but there is in the US, and that's what you're trying that's to That's my point. That in the US, because it's been met by individual players meeting narrow needs, as a customer in the US, you're like, Jesus, I have these banks and have all of these other choices. So if we can build a product that brings it together, that's the size of the price for us. Well, the proof will be in the pudding. Um, Sheikha Al-Bahar, I think you possibly get the last, the last moment here. Would you agree w with what was said? So will the future of banking narrow down so that we use all different services together? Or is it going to stay the same, which I think Zoe was making that point? Well, basically, as, as I mentioned, I fully agree that dealing with you know, youth and retail clients has to be completely digitalized. Uh, on the other side, even with digital banking, we have to make sure that we have the right security on uh, the cybersecurity issue is very important, especially with what's go going on worldwide. And of course, safeguarding the wealth of the future uh, generation, because you cannot invest billion of dollars with a small fintech company or a digital bank. It has to be with a traditional bank that, has, uh, re that is regulated by a strong regulator to make sure that the money is there to stay and not to disappear, you know? So uh, I, I fully agree with them, but again, on the retail side, but under no circumstances to be on the whole side, the wholesale side. So, but again, we have to make sure that we are offering uh, efficient service, uh, agility in the service as well, and, you know, coming up with a lot of innovation to help them in promoting their business, even, you know, the traditional uh, uh, banking clients. So basically, I, I fully agree, but again, security is an issue, regulation is an issue, to save the wealth for the future is an issue, but let's focus on acquiring, you know, the client of the future and to focus on youth. I mean, come on, this is the most important. It's kind of, you know, to kill the financial literacy within these, you know, seeds. So they, they know what they are doing. They gonna, you know, uh, uh, grow up with the mentality that they know what they're going to do. And they have, you know, a professional bank, a safe bank to help them. Uh, I, I believe we heard about uh, too many banks that went bankrupt and nobody cares, you know. So let's make sure that we have regulations, we have laws to safeguard, you know, and to continue having the wealth from, few, from generation to generation. So, uh, 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 as I said, FinTech is there to be acquired by banks, as <laughs> we <borders>. did. <laughs> we did on both, on the commercial bank again. as a payment, uh, you know, uh, channel, as well as wealth okay. management for the affluent and small investors. We are out of time. I, I would say that the one thing I think all of you agree on is really providing exactly what the customer today yep. needs. Um, Just, sorry, she, actually, this is a huge point about regulation. Uh, a lot of ink is being spilled correctly about the future and technology and all that is going to happen. And there will be fintech companies that will play in the traditional space yeah. because they will understand the importance of what you said about regulation. And I am so sorry, we are completely out of time, but you get to have more from Zoe tomorrow morning. I hope you join us for the Capital Allocators round. All right, thank you very much thank for our you. panelists. Thank you. 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 Thank you.